All right. Welcome, everyone. Hello, hello, hello. Thank you all so much for joining the Greater Chicago Food Depository team for today's webinar, The Power of Advocacy, Lifting Your Voice to Strengthen SNAP and End Hunger. My name is Taylor. I'm an Institutional Engagement Manager at the Food Depository, and I will be your host for today. And there we go. Joining us are our two lovely presenters, Skylar Larimore, Interim Vice President of Policy and Advocacy, as well as Hillary Karen, our Senior Policy Advisor. And they will be discussing the importance of policy, our policy priorities for this Hunger Action Month, and how you can get involved. So just a couple housekeeping uh, notes before we get started. This webinar will be recorded so we can share this with our network and anyone who couldn't be here with us today. Um, and also the chat function is open. So if you all have any questions throughout the webinar, feel free to drop those in the chat and we will have a Q&A at the end. So uh, for those who didn't know, today is actually Hunger Action Day. So what a great day to have this webinar. And Hunger Action Day is part of Hunger Action Month, which is Feeding America's annual nationwide campaign to spread awareness about food insecurity and engage the public in the movement to end hunger. And the Food Depository is participating in, as well as hosting Hunger Action Month initiatives through virtual events like this, uh, volunteer opportunities, campaigns, and advocacy. And as of 2022, one in seven people in the United States experienced food insecurity, and currently one in five Chicago households are experiencing food insecurity. So the magnitude of this issue is very significant, uh, but however, with collective action, we can make an incredible difference, which is the goal of Hunger Action Month. So we would also like to extend our heartfelt thanks to our 2024 Hunger Action Month anchor donors for supporting our mission and providing major gifts uh, towards our Hunger Action Month matching challenge. And the support of these donors not only includes gifts, but also long-term volunteerism, event participation, research and development collaboration, and more. And I'm very excited to introduce one of our valued partners, the Grubhub Community Fund. As an anchor donor for this Hunger Action Month, Grubhub has been a steadfast supporter of the Food Depository's mission to end hunger and our advocacy efforts. And we deeply appreciate their partnership. So we're very happy to have uh, their Director of Federal Affairs, Kara Kelber, share a few words with us today. So. Kara, take it away. Thank you so much, Taylor, and good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Kara Kelber, and I lead federal affairs at Grubhub. Thank you for the invitation to join you today during Hunger Action Month, a time where we all come together to raise awareness and take action against hunger. I'm excited that I get the opportunity to share our support for the Greater Chicago Food Depository's steadfast partnership and our shared mission to combat food security and food insecurity in our community. The Food Depository is not just a food bank. It's a lifeline for countless individuals and families across Chicago and Cook County. Your holistic approach to combating hunger not only provides immediate relief, but also empowers individuals and families to strive for long-term stability. And we're particularly grateful for your advocacy and partnership in strengthening federal feeding programs. These efforts ensure that policies are in place to support those when they are in need. And by advocating for robust federal programs, you help create a safety net that millions of Americans rely on. Your work in supporting federal programs such as SNAP, the Emergency Food Assistance Program, or TFAP, and the new Sunbuck Summer EBT Program provides critical relief. And your relentless advocacy to protect and increase access to these programs and the upcoming Farm Bill is another example of our shared commitment to fighting hunger through public policy. At Grubhub, we stand with you in the belief that no person should ever go hungry. And it's this belief that drives our commitment to supporting our local communities and working to strengthen these federal programs. And that's why we're so proud to partner with an effective organization like the Greater Chicago Food Depository. 
Through our collaboration, we have been able to directly support the food depositories, prepared meals program, distribution efforts, and partner on initiatives, such as the Grubhub Community Fund Full Plate Program. This program provided micro grants to local nonprofits dedicated to feeding our community. Through this program, many of the Food Depository's network partners have made a tangible impact, helping organizations purchase groceries, meals, and essential equipment to continue their vital work. Together, we've made strides in closing the hunger gap, but as we all know, our work is never done, unfortunately. And as we look to the future, we remain committed to supporting the Greater Chicago Food Depository. So thank you to the Dep Food Depository for your partnership your advocacy, and your unwavering dedication to our community. We look forward to continuing our journey together to end hunger here in our shared hometown. So I'll hand it back to you, Taylor. Thank you so much, Cara. Like I said, we're deeply appreciative of Grubhub's support, partnership, and aligned vision. So thank you. Okay, so uh, just a brief background about the Food Depository. We are Chicago's food bank, and we're a nonprofit organization founded by six amazing volunteers in 1979. Um, our mission sounds very simple, but it addresses a complex and multi-layered issue, which is ending hunger. And while much has changed over 43 years, we remain committed to our founder's vision for a hunger-free community. And in 2022, we actually unveiled a evolved mission statement reflecting our priorities and purpose, and it guides our work to support and serve our neighbors while addressing the root causes of hunger, which are poverty, systemic inequity, and structural racism. So in order to do the work we do, we work with a network of more than 800 community partner sites and, me and meal programs, including food pantries, soup kitchens, shelters, and more. And we are one of eight Illinois food banks in the Feeding America network. And as I stated earlier, the food insecurity rate in Chicago is unfortunately higher than um, the national rate of one in seven households. Therefore, our operations include me prepared meal distribution, uh, distributing packaged food to our partner sites, tabling community events, providing assistance with SNAP applications, and more. So um, as many of you all know, COVID surged a need like anything we've ever seen before. Um, and infl inflation quickly followed, which set our neighbors and families back in terms of providing nutritious meals for their families, um, as well as, you know, many other setbacks as well. And in the past year, federal nutrition benefits have rolled back as pa pandemic era programs expired, which caused an increase in food insecurity. So to address this increase, um, last fiscal year, we distributed 121 million um, pounds of food, which is 32% more pounds of food than we distributed the, the year prior. Um, and 7.6 million pounds went to new arrivals. And the main contributor um, for these increases were increased distributions from all sources. So we purchased 37% more food, donations increased by 28%, and government distributions also increased by 24%. As far as our prepared meals program, um, in FY24, 380,000 meals were made in-house in our prepared meal center, and we also purchased just over 500,000 meals from external vendors to support our after-school and summer programs. For our food rescue program, last year we distributed, uh, or I'm sorry, we rescued 17.3 million pounds of food from 389 local retail donors. And we have our uh, community partners to thank for this. 124 of our partners rescued this food. And we also saw an increase in this program as well. Uh, we rescued 4 million pounds more food in FY20, um, FY24, and this increase is due to our continued relationship building with retail partners, as well as adding new donors and hubs. 
For our volunteer program, last year we had 25,600 volunteers come through our doors and help us pack 7.3 million pounds of food, um, as well as donate 99,000 volunteer hours. And our volunteers increased um, from FY23 by 3,000. So we had 3,000 more volunteers help us pack food. And this increase is largely due to having more corporate groups come and volunteer with us. Um, during the pandemic, you know, many people were working from home, but now with more corporate staff returning to office, they're also able to contribute uh, more time to volunteer with us. So we're very thankful for that. And uh, last but not least, um, in FY24, we helped submit 1,099 SNAP applications and nearly 900,000 SNAP meals um, attributed to our outreach, which had a $5.5 million local economic impact. So just some um, large numbers uh, that we you know, saw last fiscal year. And this data here shows food insecurity in Chicago metro area from June 2020 to June 2024. And just for clarity, food insecurity refers to a measure of lack of access to enough food. And these rates are um, as high as it was during the height of pandemic, which is clearly alarming. Um, and households with children are more likely to be impacted. This graph here demonstrates that FY24 household visits remained elevated compared to years prior, confirming increased need for the food depositories, food distribution and services. And visits to grocery and pantry programs hovered around 200,000 visits per month. Um, so we also saw an average of 42 pounds of food per household visit to public grocery programs, and approximately 40% of households receiving community food assistance are on SNAP. Trends also show that SNAP tends to run out for many households before the end of the month. This graph uh, shows food insecurity by race and ethnicity in the Chicago metro area from April 2024 to June 2024. And as we can see, households of color are most impacted by food insecurity. And while this data source doesn't break down uh, race and ethnicity further, we do know from national studies that indigenous populations in some multiracial households, for example, also face much higher uh, food insecurity rates than average. Um, in conclusion, I know that was a lot of numbers, but um, just to wrap things up, we believe that food is a basic human right and that ensuring access to healthy food is essential to building stronger, more equitable communities. And we are here to provide food for anyone in our community at risk of hunger, because at the end of the day, no one should have to choose between food and other basic needs, uh, regardless of race, age, religion, gender identity, or any other factor. So now to get into the meat and potatoes of today's discussion, I will hand it over to Skylar to discuss uh, the role of policy in ending hunger. Okay, thank you so much, Taylor. Um, and your slides were so important because they really conveyed the gravity and the scale of the problem that we're seeking to solve of hunger in our community. So I thank you for providing a bit more of that context. I'm going to share a bit more uh, about the role of policy in ending hunger, and then I'll kick it over to my colleague Hillary to talk specifically about our focus campaign for Hunger Action Month to strengthen and protect SNAP benefits through the federal farm bill. On the next slide, I do a bit of a double click on one of the charts that Taylor showed, um, because it is interesting to look at the year of 2021 on the legend on the bottom and see that hunger and food insecurity actually went down during that period. And this truly shows the power of the safety net in action. 
policy actions truly do drive hunger. And when we have the commiserate policy responses, we can see that we can end hunger together. So during the pandemic in this period of 2021, we saw expanded child tax credit, expanded SNAP benefits, pandemic EBT or extra cash assistance going to families to buy groceries. And when all of those expired, hunger rebounded, which you can see on the outside of the square to the right. Um, families and individuals are struggling now to make ends meet and keep up with rising food prices and other expenses in their day-to-day -day lives. Um, and that's tied to inflation along with many other supply chain causes. Um, but again, just to ground us, you know, when we have commiserate policy responses, we saw in 2021 that we had the largest ever drop in child poverty in a single year. And that rate went down to 5.2%, which is the lowest ever recorded by the census. So this is not rocket science. We know that uh, we know the policies that we can implement that will address hunger today. It's just a matter of political will and collective action. The next slide shows a bit more about um, the power of policy as it relates to our safety net. So Taylor, if you click once one here, great. So SNAP or the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, uh, which we're gonna provide a bit more detail about today, SNAP alone provides nine times what the Feeding America National Network of Food Banks across the country provides. So in other words, for every one meal that the food banks like the Greater Chicago Food Depository provide, SNAP provides nine with critical crash cash assistance that goes to families to purchase groceries. Uh, policy also matters because we need government programs in order to have enough food to provide food for free to our network of over 800 pantries and shelters all throughout Cook County. So about 25% of the food that we provide comes from government programs. So we need to advocate for strong federal funding in order to make sure we have sufficient food for families in Chicagoland. And if you click once more, this iterates the point that we know that these programs are not perfect. We know that the safety net can be hard to access for many households. So nutrition programs, despite their potential, are often massively underutilized. Our research team at the Greater Chicago Food Depository estimates that over a billion dollars is left on the table in unclaimed federal benefits that could otherwise go to eligible Illinois families if they applied for them and received them. So a lot of our advocacy work focuses on strengthening programs so that more households actually have access to them and are enrolled in participating. On the next slide, I'll show a bit more about what is the nutrition safety net. It's terminology that Hillary will also use, but this is really sort of the wraparound nest of programs at the federal and state level that truly supports individuals and families to address basic needs around hunger and food insecurity. Um, so this shows you that the programs vary depending on your income level. FPL is federal poverty level. So it ranges you know, in programs that are accessible for folks that are at 100% of the federal, 130% of the federal poverty level. That's about for a household of three, about 33,500 all the way over to a federal poverty limit of about uh, households of three at $47,000. And I state those specific numbers to just double cl click on the fact that we know that the safety net is so critical and is truly meeting the needs of families that are struggling um, every single day to put food on their table for their families. It's meeting the needs of seniors that are homebound. It's meeting the needs of pregnant people who have just given birth through critical programs like WIC. It's meeting the needs of children in schools and over the summer when they access meals at school and library locations. But we also know that there are so many households facing food insecurity that are not served by this safety net. So those families that are making well and above the 185 percent of the federal poverty level, but are experiencing economic precarity. They're having to make tough trade off conversations and decisions every day between food, medicine and rent. Um, so we all we need to do everything in our power to make sure that we're strengthening and protecting the programs that you see 
on this slide, all while we make sure that they're more accessible to families and our emergency food system is really helping bridge the gaps. So when people are ineligible for other programs, they can come to our network of food pantries. And indeed they do. After a few weeks in the month, most households run out of SNAP benefits. So they come to our pantries, pantry partners to access the groceries that they need to thrive. On the next slide, I'll double click a bit more on our specific policy priorities at the Greater Chicago Food Depository. So they fall within three main buckets. The first, as I've mentioned in the last few slides, is strengthening and improving access to hunger relief programs. That's our critical safety net that we just showed on the last slide. The second is increasing the amount of healthy food that's available and affordable to all. So Hillary is gonna share a little bit more about one example program of this called the Emergency Food Assistance Program. But we're also doing a lot of work to make sure that resources are going to Illinois farmers and socially disadvantaged farmers so that we have more diversity within our supply of food that's being grown and provided to our network of pantries and shelters. So there's truly a win-win for the local economy of farmers and for our neighbors that have access to the freshest food because they deserve that dignity and choice um, that folks have at the grocery store every day when they're making purchases. And lastly, we do work to address the root causes of hunger by addressing poverty and racial inequities in Illinois. So we know that the drivers of poverty and economic instability for families in Illinois are complex. That's why as an organization, we work side by side with so many anti-poverty partners that are doing critical work all throughout the state to promote economic security. So we're doing advocacy related to the child tax credit, earned income tax credit, uh, we work side by side with partners addressing housing instability, the cost of caregiving, underemployment and unemployment. So we know that in order to address hunger, we need to tackle some of those challenges. Otherwise, we're only ever going to see increased lines at our pantries. And that's the opposite of the Food Depository's mission. On the next slide, I'll show you a bit more in case there is any uh, folks that are newer to advocacy that are on the call with us today. Um, but advocacy is your right in democracy to make your voice heard, as simple as that. Uh, advocacy falls in two main buckets as we see it. So there's the work to educate government officials and the public on an issue that requires action. Uh, thus, a webinar just like this to talk about opportunities like the Farm Bill um, that is a need for action right now. And there's another element of advocacy that's mobilizing other people to take action on an issue, because we know that this, uh, the, the scale of this problem of hunger in Chicagoland cannot be tackled with individuals acting alone. It do, does require an ecosystem of so many organizations, so many faith-based partners, so many public officials, so many members of the media that are calling for the same change. And so both of those are important to pursue simultaneously. So the food depository and our strategy, like so many advocacy organizations all throughout the state, we build partnerships with elected officials, advocates, the public, you, the folks who are on our webinar today and who will watch the recorded webinar afterwards. Uh, we do opinion editorials and we pay attention to media as an opportunity to tell stories about hunger and the opportunity to solve it in our society. And we work alongside coalition partners every single day who do their own lobbying and, and advocacy work to make sure that collectively we're doing work to promote economic security for families and thus ending hunger in Illinois. And before I wrap with one more slide, I'll just share you uh, on the next slide some case studies on what we've done and why advocacy makes an impact. So in the last legislative session, um, Hillary was one of our main drivers of this successful win in the state of Illinois, but it was a coalition effort with uh, food banks, uh, pantries, and folks in the agriculture and environmental sector that made this win possible of achieving a Illinois farm to food bank program that was funded at $2.5 million in the last state budget. Farm to food bank would resource Illinois gr growers all throughout the state to provide food to our emergency food system so that neighbors visiting our pantries and shelters have access to the freshest Illinois grown ingredients, truly a win-win for the ag sector and for our neighbors in need. And another big win at the federal scale, um, and our partners at Grubhub mentioned this on the start of the call, is we were very excited um, after many, many years of national advocacy with so many partners that the federal government acted to create 
at summer EBT. Um, pandemic EBT was a huge driver of security and nutrition support for families in the middle of the pandemic. And it truly showed that, you know, providing families with that flexible cash assistance to go purchase groceries at the store is an amazing model to address child hunger and the needs of families. And so Summer EBT was just launched in the state of Illinois this year as a new permanent program uh, that provides $120 per eligible child. And families just started receiving that cash assistance at the end of August um, that will address um, summer child hunger, but as families are going back to the school. Uh, and so we're really excited that Illinois was a leading state in implementing this new form of assistance that really works for families. And lastly, uh, we were part of a broader coalition of about 50 organizations all throughout the state that called for the Illinois child tax credit, making Illinois the 15th state in the nation to adopt a state child tax credit. And that's layered on to the federal child tax credit as well. So this win will enable up to $300 per child to be accessed for children zero to 12 in future tax years. So again, a huge driver for economic stability for families and every bit of assistance counts as families are making these tough trade-off decisions and trying to fill their, their um, kitchen and closets every single day with food. Lastly, before I transition it over to my colleague Hillary to get in the weeds about the Farm Bill, I'll show you one more slide around how we do our advocacy. So if you're interested in what we're talking about today, you want to learn more, you want to be on the journey with us, and stay up to date in real time on what we're prioritizing in advocacy and how you can get involved. We do maintain an advocacy action center. Uh, no need to write down this link. We will send it in our follow-up materials and there's a QR code on one of our final slides. But the Advocacy Action Center is our home base for all things anti-hunger advocacy in the state of Illinois. Through our, our, our Advocacy Action Center, we have action alerts. Right now we have, I think, three different federal level campaigns that you can participate in to contact your elected officials about a wide variety of anti-hunger priorities. We also do a monthly legislative update newsletter about federal, state, and local issues that pertain to hunger in Illinois. And we do occasional learning webinars just like this, so you can stay in the know the next time we have a webinar about a specific issue area, and you can get the word out with your colleagues for them to join within your community as well to learn more about our policy priorities and opportunities for action. With that, I'll hand it over to my colleague Hillary to speak about this most time sensitive opportunity for action advocacy through the federal farm bill. Thank you, Skylar. Um, as Skylar mentioned, um, the food depository engages in advocacy on the federal, state and local levels. And there are lots of opportunities throughout the year um, for us to advocate. And the Farm Bill is just one of those opportunities. So um, on the next slide, um, I'm going to do a very, very abbreviated uh, summary of the Farm Bill. Um, it is the major piece of federal legislation that governs our entire food and agricultural system. So it includes everything from farm programs, conservation programs, rural development, and also, of course, um, most exciting for us is the nutrition programs. Um, it is reauthorized every five years, um, sometimes on time, sometimes not. Um, and it's been around um, since the Great Depression. This is sort of one of those um, last wonderful examples of Congress coming together on a bipartisan basis to come um, periodically to review what's working, what's not, um, and what can we do to improve policy on a wide variety of programs. And because it is such a, a range, um, it you know requires rural, urban members to sort of come together and compromise and do things that benefit um, both farmers and also families that rely on nutrition assistance. So it, it's a great example of Congress uh, still finding ways to come together um, and improve programs that benefit all of us. Um, there have been 18 farm bills over the years, um, and we are up uh, for the current farm bill expires um, at the end of this month. It was actually supposed to be reauthorized last September in 2023, and Congress uh, provided a one-year extension to give themselves one more year to keep negotiating and keep moving forward to try to come up with a plan for a farm bill. So we do have a September 30th deadline coming up. Um, Congress came back into session yesterday and is hard at work. Um, we're waiting to see if they're going to finish it on time or maybe have to extend it again. Um, but that's sort of where we are in the negotiations. 
Um, on the next slide, <clears throat> We have done several um, webinars in the past that go much, much deeper into the Farm Bill. So if you're interested in that, I'd encourage you to check those out. We'll just give a very high level overview here, but we do have um, some great webinars that we've done over the past two years about the process for how the Farm Bill works um, and about our specific policy priorities for this Farm Bill. So on the next slide, I'm just gonna highlight a few. Um, our main priorities for the Farm Bill fall into kind of three big buckets. Um, and those are supporting the emergency food system. As Skylar mentioned, the food that food banks like the Food Depository get directly from USDA that we can then distribute um, out uh, to neighbors in the community, making SNAP more accessible and also improving SNAP benefit adequacy. Um, as Taylor and Skylar both mentioned, we know that SNAP benefits unfortunately don't usually last until the end of the month. And so there are lots of proposals out there that we support uh, to help um, close that gap um, so that those benefits will last people um, throughout the whole month. Um, thanks. On this next slide, um, this is a graph that shows where our food comes from here at the food depository. And this is probably very similar for a lot of other food banks across the country. Um, as many of your um, organizations or companies might know, we of course accept lots of donations from food manufacturers. So that makes up a large portion of the food that we distribute. We also, um, as Skylar mentioned and, um, and Taylor, uh, we do food rescue at the retail level. And so that um, is sort of the light green bar there. Um, and I, of course, we also purchase a lot of food. Um, many of our supporters don't realize that in addition um, to those sources, we're also purchasing a lot. Um, and that's where some of the local farm to food bank procurement comes in to make sure that we're using those dollars wisely. Um, and I just want to draw everyone's attention to that sort of yellow um, bar in the middle that represents the government food. Um, and the main program that uh, we receive food from, from USDA, is called the Emergency Food Assistance Program, or TFAP. And that program is in the Farm Bill. Um, so on the next slide, um, our top priority as far as supporting the emergency food system in this farm bill is called the Farmers Feeding America Act. Um, this is also the top priority for feeding America. Um, and the idea here is to increase the amount of food that USDA is able to purchase from American farmers to distribute to food banks like the Food Depository. So that is our top request to make sure that we are increasing the total amount of food that we're able um, to receive and distribute. On the next slide, kind of that second pillar, um, making SNAP more accessible. Um, one of the priority bills that we're advocating for that has gotten a lot of support um, is the Enhanced Access to SNAP Act or the EATS Act. Um, and as some of you may know, the eligibility restrictions for college students are very restrictive. They've been in place since the 1970s. Um, and what we've seen during COVID when those eligibility restrictions were relaxed is it was much easier for college students to access SNAP. Um, so that's a big priority of ours at the Food Depository um, to expand access for college students and make it easier for them to be eligible for those benefits. Um, because we know that college students are a population that experiences heightened food insecurity. Um, there are more non-traditional college students these days. I think a lot of people have a perception that everybody is going to college right out of high school or has support from their family. And that's really no longer um, the real picture of who, who is in higher education now. And so that's a really big priority for us to make it easier for college students uh, to get the food that they need to continue on with their education. Um, and then the third slide, the third pillar, um, improving SNAP benefit adequacy. Um, we also are very aware of sort of the political realities right now. So in a future farm bill, we are advocating to increase those benefits so that they last um, for the whole month. Um, in the meantime, in this farm bill, we understand that that kind of expansion is probably not as likely. In fact, there's proposals to cut SNAP benefits in the future. Um, so right now we're really focused on protecting SNAP benefits and making sure that no cuts are made. 
So um, in the short term, one of our priorities for this farm bill when it comes to SNAP benefits um, is making the benefits that families do receive more flexible. And there's a really old, outdated rule um, from years and years ago that really doesn't uh, match the way that families eat today, that SNAP benefits can only be used for cold prepared foods. Um, you know, back in the days before grocery stores had hot bars and before families were all working, you know, when they had, you know, maybe one parent staying at home, um, people were making more foods from scratch. And that just really isn't the way that people live anymore. Um, and so the Hot Foods Act is a proposal. It actually has really strong bipartisan support. There are currently 120 bipartisan members of Congress who um, are co-sponsoring the bill. Um, eight of our representatives from here in Illinois are supportive, um, and it would just eliminate that restriction and allow SNAP benefits to be used to purchase any prepared foods, um, hot or cold, um, in addition to their regular grocery items at SNAP authorized retailers. Um, and another important point on that bill is that SNAP benefits can also be used at farmers markets. And we've heard from some of our partners that it can be really difficult for vendors at the farmers markets when some of the prepared items they sell are eligible for SNAP benefits and some aren't. Um, and so it becomes an equity issue, um, both for the vendors and for the customers at the farmer's markets to be able to shop the same way um, that anybody else there um, you know, shopping uh, is able to buy and to support those local vendors too. So that's one that we're really excited about that has a lot of bipartisan support and we're hoping that we can get that added into the farm bill this time. Um, on the next slide, um, this is just a link to our Farm Bill one pager. If you are interested in learning more about those bills or about any of the other bills that we're supporting, um, there's more information there and I'm sure we'll send it out after. And another plug uh, for folks who are already subscribed to our legislative updates, we gave a summary of each of those bills in our most recent uh, legislative updates. So we try to use that newsletter uh, to educate folks about some of the, the details of the policies that we're advocating for. Um, so hopefully people will sign up for that as well. Um, great, and then I will turn it back over to Skylar to talk about our next steps for Hunger Action Month. Well, and thank you so much, Hillary. Incredible overview. Um, on the next slide, you might be feeling inspired to act based on everything Hillary just said. You said those bills sound incredible. I want to put my name on a letter um, to tell my elected official that they need to act in support of those that piece of legislation in support of a strong farm bill that will strengthen and protect SNAP. I want to double click on one thing that Hillary mentioned, which was um, right now, this year, Congress must act to strengthen SNAP, not reduce funding. And in the House proposal, uh, that has been proposed that would cut SNAP by $30 billion over 10 years. Unacceptable, all right? So every dollar cut is a meal that's taken away from a child, a low-income family, person with a disability, a senior. So if SNAP benefits are cut, millions of people across the country who are already struggling to make ends meet are going to be forced into food insecurity, we're going to see significantly longer lines at our pantry and shelter partners. And we know that that's going in the opposite direction of our work to end hunger. So this is a critical moment to act to make sure that your elected official hears from you about the need for a strong farm bill that protects and strengthens SNAP. And it elevates some of those priorities that Hillary just shared around the emergency food assistance program, making sure that we have enough food to provide out to families from that government program, the Hot Foods Act, and accessibility for college students. So if you're feeling mobilized to act today and now, uh, we invite you to use your phone camera view to uh, go over this QR code and it'll link you straight away to our Farm Bill Action Alert. I also included the link to the Action Alert in the chat as well. It will take you about two minutes to complete. And when you participate, there is an auto-populated message um, that you can send straight away to your elected officials. No need to draft new content. You can just send what we've prepared. And then oftentimes elected officials actually will respond to the, these letters that you send. It's almost like you're sending them a old school letter in the mail where they have staff people, their constituent services representatives that do read every email that comes in. They take a tally of the number of people that are reaching out to them about the farm bill in particular. And then they do a briefing with their boss, with that representative or sen senator at the federal level. And they say, 
Hey, Representative, 100 people contacted you just this week related to passing a strong farm bill. And that truly is their finger on the pulse to understand what their constituents care about and what they should be focusing their time and effort on when they're doing advocacy with their peers at the Hill. So these actions really do matter. We invite you to participate. I know sometimes because it's so easy, it can feel like it won't make a difference. Um, but our next slide truly shows in a visual way that uh, when we're acting together, and Taylor, if you just want to click ahead for the caption on all of these images, when we engage our decision makers to mobile and mobilize other people to do the same, so sharing this opportunity for action, sharing the action alert on your own social media, we know that we can move mountains and we know that this is what is necessary to truly end hunger. And just to emphasize here, we know that the Farm Bill is just a starting place. We need to strengthen and protect these critical safety net benefits so that families have this economic security that they need to thrive, all while we're simultaneously passing policies that will address the root causes of hunger, make sure that people don't need uh, as, to stay and remain on SNAP for as long as they do, and make sure that the lines are decreasing at our pantry and shelter locations. We cannot do this if we're not doing it side by side with you in this advocacy every day. So I invite you to participate in that action alert and by participation, you'll also get signed up for future alerts within our Advocacy Action Center at any time if you determine it's too much content, though we promise it's very worthwhile, educational and inspiring, uh, there's an opportunity for you to unsubscribe um, if you should choose to do so. And I'll kick it over to Taylor for one other opportunity for you to support this Hunger Action Month. All right, thank you so much, Skylar and Hillary, for an amazingly informative presentation. Um, I know that I found all of that information very, very powerful. So I'm sure our audience did as well. Um, and like Skylar said, getting involved in the Advocacy Action Center is a great way to make your voice heard um, and really promote change uh, with the uh, Farm Bill, as well as other SNAP programming. And this Hunger Action Month, we have quite a few different ways you can get involved. Um, so... Our theme for Hunger Action Month is Give Time, Give Treasure, and Grow for a Greater Chicago. Give Time, meaning we would love for you all to join us for a volunteer session at our warehouse where uh, volunteers package food into family-sized portions that we then distribute at our uh, community partner sites. And September 20th is actually our dedicated day to Hunger Action Month. So we are encouraging volunteers to come out on September 20th. However, uh, you can scan the QR code and pick any day that works for you. Um, yeah, we would just love to have you all volunteer, whether it's on the 20th or another day this month or this year. And uh, for Give Treasure, we have um, a couple of different ways you all could support financially. Um, our, our 86 Hunger campaign is our Hunger Action Month cause marketing campaign, where we are partnering with local restaurants to take hunger off the menu. So uh, the restaurants listed in, on that QR code have agreed to donate a portion of their sales to the food depository. Uh, so feel free to scroll through. There are some delicious options um, on that QR code. And a virtual food drive is another way you could give treasure. Um, it's a fun and easy way to really engage your community, engage your peers to uh, donate. And it's essentially a, um, it translates a physical food drive into a virtual one. So $1 equals three meals. Um, and it's amazing, you know, the impact you can make with that. So we definitely encourage you to check that out as well. And lastly, Grow for a Greater Chicago um, is really, really just means to learn about our advocacy work and put what you learn in action. So uh, we also have our Advocacy Action Center linked on that QR code as well. So um, I'm going to leave this up here for a few more seconds, give you all some time to scan that QR code before we do our Q&A 
and hopefully everyone has scanned it by now. And all right, so we will uh, go ahead and get started with our Q&A portion. Uh, let's see, Carolyn, did we get any, get any questions? We Not haven't correct. had any questions come through the chat or the Q&A just yet, but if anyone has questions, we will be happy to answer them. Okay, so it looks like we have one question. Um, is the Farm Bill the only opportunity to advocate? No. <laughs> Um, I definitely want to highlight this point. Um, we're focusing right now on programs like TFAP and SNAP that do fall under the Farm Bill at the federal level, but that's a really important point that that's only one opportunity, and it's just because the Farm Bill is happening right now. Um, next year and future years, there might be other opportunities at the federal level. For example, the WIC program, the school meal programs, summer EBT, summer food service program, those are all part of another piece of legislation called child nutrition reauthorization. And that also comes about um, every few years. So um, right now, since the farm bill is moving, that's been our focus at the federal level, but there are always new and different opportunities to engage um, and support those other programs too. And then of course, at the state level, as Skylar mentioned, um, things like the Farm to Food Bank program and other great initiatives at the state level, those are always ongoing as well. So there are lots of ways to get involved. Thank you, Hillary. Um, and I have a question as well. So Skylar, I know you mentioned that Congress is looking to gradually um, decrease SNAP benefits by 30 million, I believe you said is the number. 30 Can billion, I ask yeah. why they are moving in that direction if uh, rates of food insecurity are just as high as they were during, the, during COVID? Incredible question. Hillary, do you wanna tackle what's happening at the congressional level on negotiation? Sure, and I think Taylor, you're exactly right that um, when we're seeing need that is higher um, than we've ever seen before, this is the exact wrong time to be cutting benefits. It's the time that we should be talking about expanding and increasing benefits. Um, so we think that's just exactly the wrong direction um, and the wrong move to make right now when we're still seeing that elevated need in our communities. So um, there are political reasons. There's all kinds of uh, motivations for that, um, but like you said, that um, $30 billion cut that has been proposed in the House version of the Farm Bill um, would basically prevent SNAP benefits from increasing in the future. And that essentially amounts to a cut. Um, SNAP benefits are based on what's called the Thrifty Food Plan, which is a way of calculating what it costs for a family to avoid, of, afford um, a healthy diet. Um, and that is adjusted each year for inflation. And so SNAP benefits do go up a little bit each year to account for food prices. Um, but from time to time, USDA goes back and reevaluates what foods are necessary to have a healthy diet and what other factors might feed into that. Um, we had mentioned when we we're talking about the, the Hot Foods Act, people are not making everything from scratch before. So if you assume that everybody has to spend three hours a day preparing all of their meals for their family from scratch, sure, you might be able to afford a healthy diet um, you know, at a lower price, 
but is that realistic for the way that American families eat and prepare their food now? So those are the types of things that USDA um, takes into consideration when they update the Thrifty Food Plan. They also take into consideration new updated dietary guidelines for Americans, which are always being updated. Um, and the proposal in the House would say no matter what happens with nutrition guidance, no matter what changes, that those benefits could not go up in the future beyond inflation. And so it's just the wrong direction. Um, and, you know, that's going to be our top priority and a lot of our national partners as well. Um, we know our Illinois delegation has been really strong on this, saying this is not the time to cut SNAP. If anything, we should be increasing those benefits and making it easier for people to access. So we're really proud that we've got some strong representatives in Washington helping to protect SNAP. Thank you so much for providing clarity on that, Hillary. Um, definitely, definitely a huge, huge cause that um, we need to support. So thank you. Uh, it looks like we have two questions in the chat. Uh, the first one is how much time do we have to support these bills? Um, now is definitely the time. I mentioned um, September 30th is when the current farm bill expires. Congress just came back in this week and we're expecting any day now for them to announce that they're planning to meet that deadline or that they don't think they're going to be able to reach an agreement by then. So right now, this week really is a, a super, super crucial time uh, to be reaching out to your representatives and, and letting them know that you do want them to, to finish the farm bill. Thank you. Um... Definitely a huge sense of urgency. So uh, thank you for that. And then another question is, someone said, one of your images really caught my eye. It seems like you can see hunger spike after major government spending uh, with the American Rescue Plan, Ma American Rescue Plan Act in March, 2021, it was at 1.9 trillion. An Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, November 21 at 1.2 trillion. Inflation Reduction Act, August 2022, 437 billion. Is advocating to secure the safety net on par with advocating against government spending when advocating to end hunger? Taylor, could you maybe go back to that slide? Um, I want to make sure that folks were um, seeing the dates correctly, because I think it's actually the mm -hmm. opposite, that during the time when, of course, people were out of work, people were furloughed, that is when all of these COVID programs were created to help lift up families and um, blunt the impacts of uh, of the COVID crisis. And so, um, yeah, it's that one with the, the box in the middle. Um, that shows that when Congress did pass those bills and did provide expanded, but oh, sorry, the one with the squiggly line. <laughs> um, oh. Yeah, um, that during the time when those expanded benefits were in place, hunger went down. Um, and there have been several studies that have shown that without those benefits, we would have seen a huge spike in hunger. We would have seen a huge spike in poverty during that time. Thank you. Yeah. And there in that box, you actually see during the worst of the COVID pandemic, that's when hunger went down. Um, and that's because of some of those programs on the right, like the expanded child tax credit, like enhanced SNAP, like summer EBT. Um, and unfortunately, um, when those programs went away at the end of the public health emergency is when we saw poverty and food insecurity go back up, um, especially with the end of the child tax credit. It was almost instantaneous that there was a measurable increase in poverty as soon as that benefit went away. Um, so it, I think, paints a picture that we know these programs work and we saw that they were able to prevent a huge spike in poverty and food insecurity like we saw during the Great Recession because those programs were there. Um, and so I think that's the greatest argument we can make to show that's why these government programs are important um, to you know, keep, that, keep those levels low instead of allowing them to go back up. And, and it's because as Skylar mentioned, you know, just because of a lack of the political will um, to be able to continue those programs that we know work. And that's why um, all of our advocacy is so important. Thank you so much, Hillary. Okay, it looks like that was our last question in the chat. So if anyone has 
any other questions, uh, feel free to drop those in the next couple minutes. Um, we are almost at time, so um, I'll just give it a couple more minutes for questions. And um, I believe Skylar mentioned this earlier, but in our follow-up email, we'll also include the link uh, to the Advocacy Action Center. So just in case you didn't get a chance to scan that QR code, uh, we'll still include that resource in there. And like Hillary mentioned, uh, this week is crucial to make your voice heard since Congress will be <clears throat> making decisions about the Farm Bill uh, by the end of this month. So please, 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 um, you know, move with urgency and make your voice heard. They do listen to us, even if it seems like um, our representatives don't. So, um, you know, even though you're one person, you can make an incredible difference, especially with collective action. So, um, yeah, I also just want to do a quick plug. Uh, many of you who might be watching this recording afterwards, maybe you also are a member of an organization. So you're a part of your church, you're a part of your sorority, you're a part of a corporate um, employee resource group. Um, so just wanted to elevate that, you know, you can also play a critical role within the organizations that you're a part of to educate others related to anti-hunger priorities. So if there's ever any way that we can help support you in that mission, the more people that we bring into the movement, the stronger we will be in our work to end hunger. Um, so always reach out if there's opportunities for collaboration in our advocacy work. And thank you all so much for your participation in this webinar today. Yes, thank you everyone so much. Um, Hillary, any final thoughts? You covered it, thank you. This is a really crucial time, but we're just excited um, for the support from all the partners who are on or who are gonna be watching it. Um, and we'd love to have everyone join us in supporting um, the advocacy that we know is what's really long-term going to help us end hunger. Exactly. All right, well, thank you everyone for your participation. Thank you to Skylar and Hillary for an amazing presentation. Um, just to wrap up, a few ways you can get involved and we will be sending a follow-up email. This recording will be available as well if you ever wanna come back and uh, visit it. And with that being said, I hope everyone has a great rest of your Tuesday um, and let's, go out and lift our voices. <laughs>